Amen. Hey, we're in this series called No Limits. And what we're talking about is how in the world do we take our life to what we're going to call a whole nother level? Anybody take their life to a whole nother level? It is a whole nother level of financial blessing in your life. Anybody ready for a financial blessing? It is a whole nother level of the favor of God falling upon you. It is a whole nother level of God blessing your marriage, as God blessing your relationship, God blessing your job, God blessing every endeavor that you have. It is just God blessing everything. And it is about how do we take our life to a whole nother level? Now, Jabez prayed a prayer in 1 Chronicles 4.10. And he prayed a very incredible prayer. It was a very simple prayer. It was a selfish prayer, but not a selfish prayer for just him. It was a selfish prayer that he may receive a blessing of influence upon people. And his prayer was simply this. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. And the word of God says, and God answered his prayer. How many of you want to be blessed? How many of you want to, no, not, not, yeah. How many of you want to be blessed? Yeah. yeah. How many of you want to live that abundant life that God has planned for you from the very beginning of time? That you receive the mercy, that you receive the grace, that you receive the favor and the blessings of God. What does this blessing look like? How in the world do we pursue it? And when we do pursue it, how do we receive it and move on in the name of Jesus? Well, we're going to look at, through this series, we're going to look at a few points that we learned from the life of, of David, of some things that he learned through ups and downs before and after in his life. How many people love the ocean? Yeah. <laughs> you like the ocean? Yeah. Uh, I'm a West Texas boy. And I don't know if anybody has noticed this, but we don't have a whole lot of beaches in Amarillo. The ocean, to me, is big. I'm smart, aren't I? It is deep, and it is a little bit what you might call scary. Because there's something about the ocean, to me, that is interesting. You can't see what is underneath you. Da -dun. Da -dun, da -dun. I'm always afraid that I, I, probably be more like, I'm always afraid that while you're bobbing in the ocean, dangling your legs, that something is going to come up underneath you and nibble on might nibble on a lot more than just your toes, but you know what I'm saying? It was a while back I went to Mobile, Alabama to visit my brother's in-laws. They have a, a beach house. Poor people they have a beach house right there at Gulf Shores, and we had gone down to Gulf Shores, and I don't know a whole lot about the ocean, but they had a little thing called a boogie board. Anybody know what the little boogie board is? It's like a little bee surfboard about half the size of your body, and they were telling us that, well, if you don't know how to, how to uh, you know, surf or anything like that, you can run from the beach, and you can run out there and dive on that boogie board, and you can kind of ride some waves out, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the water. I am scared to death of the water. I dog paddle quite well. That's about it. And uh, anyway, I'm on that boogie board, and they had already told me, be very careful that you don't drift out too far. Anybody ever been in the ocean? Anybody ever get caught in that drift? I tell you what, uh, I'm a West Texas boy, and I wasn't listening completely to what I needed to be listening to. This is what I know. But I got on that boogie board, and as I started kind of messing around, if you're not careful, you can get caught in a drift. You can get caught in that kind of that tide that is going out, and it will start to pull you away from shore. And it will be interesting because there's one moment you can see the, the sand underneath you through the water, and the next moment it turns pitch black, and that's the moment you go, how deep are these waves right now? And then you start putting the movie Jaws in your head. <laughs> You start role-playing all this stuff. You start getting a little bit kind of scared of the water. And then you start to try to get back in. And it doesn't matter how hard you are beating that water. The drift keeps taking you out a little further and a little further. And then if you're this West Texas boy that doesn't know anything about water, panic <laughs> settles in. Yeah. Fear of the unknown, what is taking place. As I'm on that boogie board and 
the water would kind of come in and get a little more shallow, but then it would go back and it would get pitch black. It would come back in. I'm sitting there kind of trying to get back into shore. The drift is carrying me further away. And all of a sudden, I noticed as we come in, the sun is shining just perfect. And the sun hits, and I can see the sand as the water comes back in. I can see the sand just perfect under the boogie board. And all of a sudden, there is something underneath me that's got a tail on it that is about this long. And I panic. I absolutely panic. I am beating the water with everything I've got in me, trying to get back. And guess what happens? It takes me right back out, and everything turns pitch black. And I'm going, dear Jesus, I don't know where it went. Comes back in. And that stinking thing is underneath me again. And I'm looking at it going, ah! and it goes back out, and everything's pitch black. And in my mind, I'm going, oh, this drift is going to kill me. This drift is, and I don't know what is underneath me. And about five or six different times, the tide kept bringing me in, the drift kept bringing me back in, and I've kept watching this thing swimming underneath me, knowing it is just fixing to eat me. And if it eats me, I know my mom is going to be just crying forever because I'm her favorite son. <laughs> It goes back out, and all of a sudden it comes back in, and I look at this thing underneath me, and it is shaped just like me. The tail turns into two legs and feet, and I discovered very fast that it was the shadow of me. <laughs> it was my shadow, and I thought, the drift, the fear, Everything that was taking place in my life, I began to build this imagination of how horrible things were. And it reminds me of life. Doesn't it remind you of life? How often do we as people get caught up in the drift of life? The drift of society, the drift of peer pressure, the drift of trying to just, just do what everybody else is doing, and we get caught in this drift. And when this drift begins to take us out deeper and deeper and deeper, it is amazing the fear that will build in our mind of things that we don't know how this thing is going to turn out. And the enemy will make things look so much bigger in your mind than what they really are. What we're talking about is this drift has a tendency to always take us into danger. Now, as we look at the life of David, David is a beautiful picture of before and after. It is a beautiful picture of the call of God upon someone's life. It is a beautiful picture of a man who's been anointed to do something absolutely incredible. It is a beautiful picture of how an enemy will sneak into that calling, how an enemy will sneak into that anointing, how an enemy will sneak in sometimes so subtly to kill, steal, and to destroy that which God said, I have sent my son Jesus Christ to give life for. And it is a beautiful picture of how David, in his calling, in his anointing, got caught in a drift of sin sexual desire he got caught in a drift that pulled him in the wrong direction and in the pull of that wrong direction how devastation seeped into his life but i love the picture that god paints through the life of david because our god is a god of second chances i say all the time that he's a god of the mulligan if i've got any golfers in the house you know exactly what that is what that is he is a god of the mulligan he is a god of the do-over and it doesn't it does not matter how far the drift has a tendency to take us in the wrong direction. We've got a God who is big enough to pull us back in because Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, I've got a plan for your life, a plan to, to prosper you, to give you hope, and to give you a future. So what does this look like? How do we get there? Well, I want to take you to, to Psalm chapter 1. And in Psalm chapter 1, David is writing this psalm, and he's given us a step-by-step -step of how to receive a, a, a blessing in our life, how to understand that in God, 
There are no limits. There is no ceiling to God's love. There is no ceiling to the limits of what God wants to do, the blessings He wants to pour out on, up on each and every one of us. And so He paints us a picture of this. And starting in, in Psalm 1 1, it says this Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. We talked about this last, last week. And what we talked about last week was what we do is we don't walk in step with the wicked, but what we do is we step it up. We take a step up. We take a step to a whole nother level of trusting God, to a whole nother level of, of an experience, of an understanding of what God wants in our life. It is where we, we step up our relationships and we step it up and we just trust God for something different. But then he goes on to say this, or stand in the way that sinners take. And we we're going to talk about that today. Or sit in the company of mockers. We'll talk about that in two weeks. But who delights, but, but whose delight is in the, Lord, in the law of the Lord, and who meditates upon his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now, we're dissecting this as we go, but we're looking at the principle that God has given us. This is what is so great about God. Are you ready? God does not make any of us serve Him. Not at all. God is a gentleman, and the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and how they draw us to them. But God never says, I demand that you serve me because this is what God knows forced love is not love at all and so what God does in his love for us he loves us so much he created us with a will he created us with an ability to choose how we want to live you can choose wild or you can choose wisdom you can choose to serve me or you can choose to dis disobey me. You can choose to accept me or disown me. God says, I love you so much. I have created you with a special plan. I have created you with a special purpose. I have something I want you to do. I have something I want you to succeed in. I have a design for your life. But the choice is yours how you want to live your life. Now, Whenever we live our life according to our own wills, it's almost like God takes that umbrella off of us and we're just subject to whatever comes. But whenever we are walking hand in hand in a relationship with God, and we've made this identity, God, I'm yours, yours, mine, we're in this together, we are married, I've got the ring to prove it because I've been baptized in front of all of my peers and my friends, it is, a, it is the experience of the baptism in my life, and we are living for Jesus Christ, in that God says, this is what I want to do with you, you have now chosen me, I want to bless you, I want you to walk underneath my favor, I want you to walk underneath my blessing, I want you to take your life, and I want to elevate your life to a whole another level of understanding to a whole nother level of blessing to a whole nother level of of a favor i want to do something in your life that is absolutely incredible but how do we receive this how do we walk in this well god tells us he said he says the choice is yours but in this choice you don't have to raise your hand because i probably know the answer to this in your choice how many in this room would say there are times in my life that I have chosen unwisely. I've got a several amens. Can we just be honest? I mean, can we just be honest? How many in this room would say, not only did I just choose poorly, but I was downright just stupid? Can we just... <laughs> got some big amens in the back. Waving the hand and everything, flag flown high over the banner. Uh, <laughs> we've done some stupid things because we chose to worship self instead of choosing to worship God. You know what is so amazing about God? Is the freedom that we experience in Jesus Christ. The Word of God says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Has anybody ever been set free? 
Isn't it the most incredible feeling in the world not to live in bondage, not to be held down, but to be able to walk out and breathe in freedom, to be able to breathe in freedom of health, freedom of, of something that's in your mind, freedom of something that's in your spirit. But how often do we abuse that freedom that God's given us? Instead of walking in the freedom that God has for our life, we have a tendency to walk in the freedom to only want to satisfy self. And boy, I, I have learned that when I satisfy self and self only, I get myself in some big troubles there. Anybody with me? You might disagree with this, but I believe the happiest people, the happiest, I believe the most fulfilled people in this room are people who truly know and understand God's purpose and plan for their life. That, that's what I honestly believe. I'm going to read this. You might want to Facebook this. It might be your, your quote for the day. But I believe God wants for you the thing you want for you if you only knew what he knows. I'm going to say it one more time. I believe God wants for you the thing you would want for you if only you knew what he knows. God's wisdom is incredible. God's understanding is incredible. David, in the middle of good and bad and good, in the middle of sin, in the middle of rejecting and going for the kingdom of self instead of serving God and failing and failing what we would call miserably, David understood something in God, and he writes about it in Psalm 139, verse 14. And I'm reading from the American Standard Version, but this is what David says. I will give thanks unto thee. First of all, i got to stop right there. He is understanding who his source is. He is understanding who the giver of blessing is, who the giver of favor is, who the giver of mercy is. And in that understanding, he is now giving praise to God. I will give thanks unto thee. Why is he giving thanks to God? Why is he praising God? Because he now understands truly the extent of his life and the purpose and the plan that God's got for his life. And he goes on to say this, For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He is understanding that God does not create junk. You are not a mistake. You are not an outcast. You are a child of God created in his image for a plan and for a purpose. There was, there was time thought out in you. Ah, David's understanding this. And he says, wonderful are thy works. <laughs> kind of he's saying this. Now that I know who I am in Christ, and now I'm walking in this in Christ, I can look at the mirror and say, dude, you are something on a stick. God, you did good with this thing right here. I told everybody one time, just, just, just call me Pastor Corndog, because I am something on a stick. Amen? And he's understanding now who he is in Christ. I have been fearfully and I have been wonderfully made. God, you do good work when you do work. And that my soul, deep down inside, this understanding, it has become like rhema inside of me. It is an understanding that is real. It is an understanding that is right. And he says, now my soul inside, I know this very well. I know this truth. I know who I am in God. So as we study this and we begin to look at this, we understand that David has an idea. David's got some steps. David is the perfect picture of the before, the during, and the after. And if you're going to learn something from somebody, learn from somebody who has the anointing, who has been called, who has been caught in the drift and pulled out into deep water. But not only that, somebody that God said, I have not given up on you. I am not done with you. It doesn't matter how big your sin may be, how, how far you have gone. 
I am still pursuing you. I am still after you. I will pull you back through anything that you're in because I have a plan and I have a purpose for your life. How do we know this? Again, let's go to Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11 may need to be a scripture that somebody in this room grabs a hold of and it becomes a life scripture for you. But it says this, God is speaking. For I know the plans. What does that tell you? God had forethought in you. When God planned you, he planned you with a purpose. He planned you with an ideal. He planned you with a reason. And in that, he's not going to plop you out here and just give up on you. But he's got a plan to elevate your life, to bless your life, to a whole nother living of, of just experiencing God. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. What are the plans? He's got plans to prosper you. Come on, punch your neighbor and say, God's got a plan to prosper you. Too many people enjoy that hitting your neighbor. <laughs> He's got plans to prosper you, not to harm you. How many people think that God has a magnifying glass and he's kind of frowning us like a little ants on a sidewalk? <laughs> I got you now. No, he's got plans to prosper you, not to harm you. He's got plans to give you hope. Hope. Can I just keep reiterating that word until somebody understands what I'm saying? He's got a plan to give you Hope, hope, and not only hope, he's got a plan to give you a future here and there. That is good stuff. You know what we need to make sure we do? We just need to make sure that we get on the right escalator. Amen? He's got a plan. He's got a plan. Don't give up on God because God is not giving up on you. Now, if I know that, And I know that God knows that. How many of you know that the enemy knows that as well? And if I know that, and if God knows that, the enemy is going to do anything he can to keep you away from God. And if he can't keep you away from God, what he's really going to try to do is to keep you from doing anything great for God. And that's what the enemy will do. The enemy will completely come at you. And sometimes the enemy comes at us and it is subtle. But sometimes the enemy comes at us and it is unbelievable. See, the enemy comes at you in two dominant ways in your life. The first way is this. He will come at you with opposition. And opposition generally comes from the outside. Opposition will come in the middle of a marriage where the enemy comes in and tries to kill, steal, and destroy that which God wanted to ordain as holy. The enemy will come in with this opposition to divide families and to destroy families. That is why I believe in, in, in the last 20, 30 years that we have seen more church splits because the enemy wants nothing more than to keep the vision of the church small. And if the enemy could come into the church family and divide the family of God, then he can keep us from doing anything great from God. Opposition always attacks what God has ordained to bring together. It could be opposition from relationships, from businesses, but the enemy always comes in with opposition. Uh, Opposition, when opposition attacks, don't you find that the words that we always use as a regret are words like this, I coulda, I shoulda, I woulda, and that's what's always, always associated when the enemy wins with the opposition of things that are attacking us and he tries to keep us down. But there's also opposition, uh, op- oppression. And oppression comes inward. Opposition is outward. Oppression is inward. It is where oppression, it literally attacks a person's life. And where does it attack? In the mind. We begin to think different. We begin to take on loser mentality. Um, I had a very hard job that I did this last week that literally wore me out. And Tana had taken me to go get some food or something in the car. 
And I was using some very negative statements. This is impossible. There's no way that I could do this. And Tana just decided to get on her little soapbox and become the preacher that she is. And she began to preach a little sermon to her daddy. And she said, Daddy, if you're going to preach it, you better be able to speak it. Daddy, quit telling yourself that you can't. Daddy, quit saying that this is impossible. She said, Daddy, quit saying those things and speaking those things into your life. And Tana began to speak this positive message over me. I was having what? <sighs> I was having a pity party. There was an impression that was taking place in my mind. And I was physically worn out. I was mentally worn out. And I was talking about this. I couldn't even get anything out. And she began to speak over me saying, Dad, you can do this. You can accomplish this. This task is not too big. And then she threw in the part that I, I was like, okay, that's cool. And she goes, and besides that, you've got me. Yeah. And you know, after I got to thinking about all that and putting this sermon together, I went, isn't that how my prayers a lot of times go with God? God, this thing is too big. God, I'm tired. I'm physically wore out. I'm mentally wore out. I don't think I can do this. And God is up there going, but, but you've got me. You've got me. There's nothing that is too big. There's nothing that is impossible. You can do it. And guess what? I accomplished it. I did. I accomplished what looked like was going to be impossible. So David gives us these, these ideas of how we can get to this next level of living. And he's a beautiful picture of the before and the after. See, David was called to be the next king of Israel. David was called as a boy to be a ruler. David was called and he was taken from tending sheep on the back 40 all by himself to God saying, oh, but I've got a plan and I've got a purpose for your life. I'm about to elevate your life to a whole nother level of experience, to a whole nother level of leadership. I'm about to elevate your life. You are anointed as, as king. You may be in the sheep pen right now, but I'm about to put you in the palace in charge of everybody. See, David is a beautiful picture of the before and the after. Joseph is a beautiful picture of before and after. God, When God got a hold of Joseph, he was in the pit. But God chose, took Joseph from the pit and put him in the palace. Moses is a beautiful picture of the before and the after. When God had called Moses, you know what he was running from? For 40 years he was running because he had murdered someone. And God said, I know what is in your past, but I know what is in your future because I've already planned this and put this in your future. I've got a purpose and a plan for your life. And I'm calling you from hiding on the backside of the desert of being a murderer to leading my people to the promised land. Beautiful picture of the before and after. Jonah is a beautiful picture of the before and after. God had a call upon his life. God said, I want you to preach the good news to people and bring people to the knowledge of who I am. Jonah decided, I'm going to worship the kingdom of self right now. Something else is more important. And he ran to Tarsus trying to run away from God. But God is such a beautiful understanding creator and he knows that there's a purpose and a plan for our life Jonah answers the call of God but not until he is in the belly of a fish for three days and God finally gets his attention and he says I will do whatever you call me to do he's a beautiful picture of the before and after the apostle Paul is a beautiful picture of the before and after when God called the Apostle Paul into full-time ministry, do you realize what he was doing? He was crucifying the church of Jesus Christ. He was doing anything he could to destroy the work of God upon this earth. Everything that the Messiah had come to establish, the Apostle Paul was completely going against it. He was having Christians murdered for their faith in Jesus Christ. And in the process of 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 murdering in the process of tearing down churches in the process of going completely against what God sent his son Jesus to do God looked at him and says oh but I'm not done with you yet 
I'm not done with you because I've got a plan. I've got a purpose for your life. I've got something that I want to do in you. I've got something that I want to do through you. He said, I'm not done with you. So on the road to Damascus, he knocks Saul off his horse. He knocks Saul to the ground. And Saul is a beautiful picture of the before and the after. Isn't it incredible what God does to a person's life? No matter how far you've gone into the drift, isn't God and His love a beautiful picture of how far He will go, the length He will go, the depth He will go to pull you back to safety, to pull you back to His plan, to pull you back to your understanding of who you are in Christ? I may not make it to the rest of my notes. Is that okay? But the question that I want to leave you with is this. The question that you've got to understand is this. You've got to understand who you are. You've got to understand who your God is. You've got to understand your purpose. You've got to understand your identity. You've got to understand because if you don't know who you are in God, there is an enemy there is a whole host of demons. There is a whole evil presence that is around that will pull you into the drift, pull you into the dark water, pull you into the deep, the deep end, and try to get you so far out there that you cannot find your way back. Anybody there? Anybody caught in the drift? Anybody caught in the evil pull? Anybody got caught in something that you thought was right or you thought was fun for a moment, but then all of a sudden, in giving in and giving in and giving in, what you have found is instead of having freedom in your life, you are held in bondage to a bottle. You are held in bondage to a needle. You are held in bondage to sex that you think you have to have just to have a relationship. You are tied to something that holds you down and keeps you back, and there is no freedom in your life because the enemy has used the lure of this world to pull you into the drift to get you into the deep water where you will be lost and drowned in your hope who are you who are you now see i you are a priest and why are you here i'm gonna kiss you after this that was good that was good i'm really not gonna kiss you I'll let Chris do it. <laughs> Pucker up, big daddy. Who are you? Who are you? Because if you don't understand who you are, you don't know who you are, you don't know your identity, you will have an identity crisis, won't you? Because there is an enemy who will give you the identity, a false identity, of who you think you are instead of who you are. So in that identity, in Jesus Christ, I have to decide and discover who I am. Can I pick on me for just a moment? Do you know who I am? I'm Ronnie. I am Ronald Kent Woodward. I have to identify who I am in the name of Jesus. I'm Ronnie. That's who I am. This is who this. Sorry. This is what you see is what you get. I'm Ronnie. But you know what I am? I'm a son to my mama. So everything that I do, I want to honor her in everything that I do. I am a husband. And in that being a husband, I have to know who I am in Christ. I have to know as a husband, every decision I make affects my wife. That's why I am a priest in my household. And everything that I do, my purpose, there's a whole sermon tied to this if you don't, don't have time to get into it. My purpose is to set up a meeting place for God and man to meet. And if I can't minister to my wife, if I can't keep this right, how in the world am I ever going to have a relationship with you guys? How in the world if I can't show the love of Christ to her in a, in a marriage commitment, how in the world can I ever show the love of Christ to you guys. So I have to understand who I am as a son, giving honor to my mom for bringing me into this world. How many of you know your mama brought you in? She can take you back out. Amen. But honor my mama, honor my wife. But I'm going to tell you something. There are things in my life that I literally say no to. Not because I think they're a sin, but I will say no to certain things in my life 
Because above and beyond anything in the entire world, I never, ever want to disappoint these two girls. Okay, these three girls. I never want to disappoint my girls, ever, ever. So there are things in my life that I will say no to. You may do them. That's between you and God. That's fine. You do whatever you want to do. You'll answer for that in, in your eternity, all by yourself. But there are things that I will put a standard in the ground, and there are things I will say absolutely no to. Not at all. Because I never want to lose influence here. I never want to catch somebody to catch me doing something and go, oh, but I thought, this is the most, who am I? I'm a son. Who am I? I'm a husband. Who am I? I'm a daddy. You've got to know who you are. But not only that, you've got to know who your God is. Because if, I mean, if you don't know who you are in Christ, and if you don't know who God is in your life, man, you, you're just picking up the gun and shooting and missing the target altogether. You're shooting, but you're just missing the target. You've got to understand who God is. Who is God? God is your creator that created you with a plan and he created you with a purpose. He created you with this incredible identity that he gave you and you alone. Your fingerprint is like no other fingerprint. And that fingerprint identifies you. When I put my fingerprint down, they scan it. It says that I'm Ronnie Woodward. It's not confused. You got to know that in Christ, God has created you with a specific DNA. God has created you with a plan. He's created you with a purpose, and it is the identity. And so David is telling us the first thing you've got to do is you've got to step up. And the second thing that you've got to do is you've got to stand, basically step out. You've got to take a stand. It is a stand that David says, says you've got to step out of where you've come from. You've got to step out of the situation that you found yourself in. You've got to step out of the sin. You've got to understand, and you've got to take a step, take a stand for something. You know what I mean? See, if we've given the enemy an inch in our life, what he will turn into is he'll become our ruler. And it will be the absolute standard that you set your life to. But this is what I know. I tell everybody all the time. You eat an elephant one bite at a time. People say, how do I live the Christian life? How, how, do I, how do I become better? How do I have this identity? It is baby steps towards Christ. And what we do is we celebrate every little step. And the little steps are this. I'm trusting God. I'm going to rejoice in that one step. I'm just trusting. I don't know what else to do. I'm at the end of the barrel. I'm at the end of my rope. Finances are gone. Everything's gone. All I know is there's, I'm, I'm just going to trust God. And we celebrate the fact of that little baby step of trusting God. Well, what do I do in the morning? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's look towards Christ and take another step. <gasps> I had a little bit more faith today. Oh, well, you know what? I got a little bit of joy in my life right there. Oh, you know what? There's a little bit of hope that I didn't have yesterday. There's a peace that now passes all understanding. Oh, I've made a standard. I'm getting away from some old friends. I'm getting away from some old situations. I'm getting. I'm saying no to some things that I should have said no to a long time ago. Oh, you know what? I'm saying yes to the things of God. I'm saying yes to going to church. I'm saying yes to going to Bible study. I'm saying yes. I'm going to read the Word of God, even though I don't understand what it's saying. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to start re re reading it and understand it. And I'm going to let that thing turn into rhema in my life. And I'm going to rejoice in the fact that now I'm beginning to grow. Oh, I didn't know God loved me that much. And before long, in all these baby steps, we end up down here looking back going, whoo, look where I was. Yeah. Look where I was. Yeah. Come on. And this is what I know. David says we got to learn to stand up. we got to learn to step out. If we're ever going to elevate ourselves to another experience in Jesus Christ. Anybody in this house ready to take it to a whole nother level? Oh, yeah. Are you ready to take it to a no other level? Yeah. Are you ready to take it to a whole nother level? Won't you stand with me today? And as you stand with me today, this is our prayer. Are you ready? This is our prayer. God, take me right where I am. Take me in the middle of my mess. Take me in the middle of my mess up. 
Take me in the middle of my screw up. Take me in the middle of me not understanding. Take me in the middle of me not having enough faith. Take me in the middle of, of everything that I'm doing. And don't let me get caught in the drift, God. But I pray that right now that you will begin to pull me back in and show me the plan and show me the purpose you've got for my life. With every head bowed, nobody looking around, I'm going to ask this question. There's no need in this place to ever be embarrassed. Because in this house, we embrace where you come from. We understand. Why do we understand? Because all of us in this room have been lost from one time or another. Everybody in this room has been caught in the drift that has pulled us out. But for a lot of us, we just understand now that God is the saver and he pulls us back in. And if you're in this place today and you feel like you've been caught in the drift, I want to pray with you. You feel like you've been caught in something that's pulling you away. I want you to understand that in Christ there's hope. Now this is what I'm going to do. Every head bowed, nobody looking around, been very reverent in the room. It's me and you and God, okay? I am not going to call you out of your seat. I am not going to chase you down the parking lot and tackle you if you raise your hand, okay? I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, form, or fashion, but I want you to understand this. There is a God that wants to save you, and there is a God that wants to deliver you, and there's a God that wants to put you on the right path. Amen. If you're in this place today and you feel like you've been caught in the drift, I want to I just want to pray with you before you leave. And if that's you and you want your pastor to pray for you, I'm gonna ask right where you're at, just raise your hand. I'm not gonna call you out. I see it, 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 I see it. Anybody else? I see it. You can put it back down, I see it. Anybody else? I'm caught in the drift. Anybody else? I see it. I feel like I'm being sucked out into deep water. I see it. I feel like I'm being pulled in a direction I know I don't need to go. And now in that direction, I feel there's fear and there's no hope that's starting to settle in. One last, one last time before I pray. Anybody else? Just say, Pastor, I see it. Pastor, pray for me. Okay, understand this. We're going to pray here in just a second, but if you raised your hand, I need you to understand this. Those baby steps I was just talking about, that elephant that we're just about ready to eat, this is your first bite, and this is your first step. And we're going to rejoice that you just identified that you've got a problem, that you identified that you need God. And in that, you're stepping up and you're stepping out. You're taking a stand. I'm going to pray with you right quick. And as I pray, if you don't know how to pray, you just start saying the name of Jesus over your life because there is power in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for each and every person that's in this room that's struggling. Father, I pray for each and every person that's in this room that feels like they are in the middle of a fight, that they're being sucked in the wrong direction. I'm going to pray that in the name of Jesus that the freedom that you bought for us on Calvary comes into our life and begins to change us and set us free. And we claim that in the name of Jesus. Those bonds that have held us back are loosed in the name of Jesus. Those chains that have held us prisoner for so long that is tethered to sin in the name of Jesus We come against any stronghold that tries to destroy us. In the name of Jesus, we come against any weapon that has been formed against us. In the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against us will prosper. Because my God is the beginning and He's the end. My God is the perfect, beautiful picture of the before and the after of what He wants to do in our life. And God will deliver us today in the name of Jesus if I receive it and I receive it today in the name of Jesus. For every person that raised their hand, freedom is yours. You need to begin to claim that. Freedom is mine in the name of Jesus. Freedom is mine in the name of Jesus. That sin that I have found myself in is gone and I claim freedom in the name of Jesus. That mental anguish that I've been fighting and going through that has pulled me away into deep water. I claim freedom in my mind in the name of Jesus. I can think clearly in the name of Jesus. 
Today my steps will be towards God and not towards the wicked way. My steps will be in the right direction and not the wrong direction. Father, I pray today for everyone that raised their hand that you will put our feet on the right path, that we can walk in the right path. Help us to step up and to step out and to take a stand in the name of Jesus. Now this is the most important thing. I want you to take a moment and talk to God and say, I receive your forgiveness. Go ahead, talk to him. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your healing. I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. Father, I receive that peace into my life. It is that peace that passes all understanding. Father, today, I'm going to start to walk in your favor and walk in your blessing, and I'm beginning to receive that very best that you have for me. Go ahead and receive it. Begin to receive it. Say, I receive it in the name of Jesus. You might be here today, and if you're in this place and you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, we never want to miss an opportunity to pray with you. And again, every head bowed, nobody looking around. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you. But if you do not know Jesus and you want to receive him in your life, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand, and we're going to pray with you today. Just pray that Jesus will come into your life. Anybody? I don't think there's a hand. Are we good? Can I pray a prayer of blessing before I stick you in the public? Can we do that? Hey, are you glad you came to the house of the Lord? Yes. Are you excited about what God's doing in your life? Yes. Father, we love you. And Father, we give you all the praise, and we give you all the glory, and we give you all the honor. Father, today we stand in awe of who you are. We stand in awe of the miracles that you are performing. We stand in awe that you take us before and prepare a plan for us that you take us during and you never take your eyes off of us no matter what we're in. But you set our foot on the right path. you got a right plan. And we love the after that we see of who we are in Christ. Father, I pray, pray that as we leave this place today that we will leave blessed in the name of Jesus that we will leave with favor in the name of Jesus, that we will leave with a smile on our face and a skip in our step. And Father, I pray for a hedge of protection around everybody's life as we leave, and we celebrate you because of who you are. As everybody says, amen. amen.